So there was an art contest held in a school one Christmas season a few years ago in East Texas. One of the prize winners was a picture drawn by a nine-year-old boy showing the three men offering gifts to the baby Jesus in his manger. What made this picture unique, though, is how the three gift presenters arrived. There was a fire truck on the side of the picture. The principal asked the boy about this, his decision to draw the truck, and the boy, in his very East Texas accent, was quickly to reply, Well, the Bible says the wise man came from afar. <laughs> ah, so Christmas, in terms of all it means to us. What I want to focus on in terms of our attention today is really where Christmas began. And I'm not really talking about Bethlehem. I'm talking about way, way back in eternity past when there was no sun, there was no moon, there was no creation. Even the angels hadn't been created. I don't know when it was exactly when God made the decision to accomplish Christmas, to accomplish our salvation. And I don't even know it's fair to say that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit would have a board meeting. And whether the Father would open up that meeting and say, hey, you know something, Son, Spirit, I've decided to create. I've decided to do this work of miraculous things in terms of creating a class of angels, which would then lead, lead to the need for creating a creation of men, and an earth, and planets, and solar systems, displaying my glory in wonder. But the reality is we know that I'm the kind of God that ultimately would not want robots to serve me. So in the presence of all this creation, one of the most important principles to exist will be free will. And ultimately, our creation will choose against us. They will choose to defy and disobey. And that will create a need for salvation. And as that understanding is there, whether, again, if that's an eternity past, is that the fall of man? I imagine that it's not. I don't think God thought of salvation when Adam and Eve fell. I think he knew that that was going to happen. And so, again, in eternity past, I wonder who had the idea first. Was it the Father saying, you know something, Jesus? or at that point in time, the second person of the Trinity, I want you to become a human being. I want you to become a, 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 a flesh. Or was it Jesus saying, I volunteer, I have an idea, this is the way mankind could be saved. But again, however that decision happened, what I want to think about this morning is what value came to God and to salvation by virtue of Jesus becoming flesh. By virtue of Jesus becoming a man. Because ultimately, outside of Jesus becoming a man, outside of Bethlehem, outside of, again, whatever choice happened, at whatever point in time in God's economy, in God's conversation, in God's mind, that this is the way he would do it. I think he did it very much on purpose. And so I think the, va the va first valley that comes to God by virtue of Jesus becoming a man is that he's, a he's able to identify with humankind. He's able to identify with us. I think many of us are aware of this program that I'm not even sure if it's still on. I never really watched it, but I certainly get the concept of undercover boss. You know, basically the, the CEO, the head of the company, the president, the guy that's in the boardrooms and behind the desk. He, he gets his, his work clothes on. He goes to the common laborer, the lowest level guy working in the company. And without knowing or revealing himself, he seems like he's the, 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 the worker right along with them. And ultimately, when it's revealed after that, in terms of just what understanding that CEO gets from that... Ultimately, what, what he re re is revealed to him and also what he's able to reveal to those people in terms of his care and his concern and his identification with them. I mean, isn't that really the point of that? That ultimately he's seeking to get on the ground level so he can understand what people are going through. I think ultimately that's what God desired to accomplish by Jesus becoming a human being. I mean, ultimately that's what compassion is, right? Right? It is ultimately walking in someone else's moccasins, ultimately identifying with all the things that they are dealing with. And when you turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we see again that this is, was very much a desire of God, and again, the only way that he would be able to accomplish this is by virtue of Jesus becoming a human being. So he, Hebrews chapter 4 Verses 14 through 16. And it says here, again in Hebrews chapter 4, verses, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, 
since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one that has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, I don't know how this verse hits you, but we have to understand the miracle and power that is here. Ultimately, the compassion that it is in our great God. This God who was supreme. This God who was in heaven. This God who was spirit. This God who had no need in and of himself, but by virtue of who he is, again, he creates. By virtue of who he is, he saves. By virtue of who he is, he identifies. So ultimately, to understand that when we understand our lives and we understand our interaction with God, do you realize that there's never a moment in time that you can't go before God and say, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. Every time, every moment, every circumstance we face, we can go to our God and say, you do understand. That's what this, these verses tell us. That you understand what I'm dealing with. When I'm tempted by sin. When I have broken relationships. When I have people attacking me. Discrediting me. Injustice happening in the world. And I'm interacting and engaging with that in certain emotional ways. Or reactive ways. Or whatever it might be. Father, we, we, or we would never go before our Father. And again, find an un uncompassionate ear. An ear that again, doesn't ultimately identify and understand who we are. But do you see how Jesus becoming a man makes that possible? See, outside of Jesus becoming a man, we might, we might be suspect about that. See, we understand that, gee, that God is omniscient, right? That ultimately God knows everything. So in some ways, God wouldn't need to become a man in order to know our frame, to know our struggles, to know this, the things we deal with in our lives. But I think if God didn't become human, and he made a statement like this to us, we might be suspect of that. Well, God, how can you really know what it's like in terms of living my life? How can you, how can you know what it's like to, to, to like a girl and she doesn't like your back, or have these demons in your head that are talking to you about your that lack of value, or the temptation of sin you might commit, or whatever? And as we're dealing with that, again, God would know it in, uh, is in, in his omniscience. But to know that God took that e extra step, so now we would not be suspect in terms of his understanding. That we know that Jesus, when he was here, he lived a normal life. I love uh, films that ultimately, you know, maybe they go too far in terms of filling certain gaps in terms of what Jesus was like, like a boy. But I like those that have Jesus having fun, having friends, playing and romping and doing things that little boys do and what teenagers do, never disobeying their parents or learn that, kids. Uh, but ultimately, again, he would be normal in terms of the way he would be. And so now when we come to him, we come with a great understanding of his compassion towards us and the fact that he desired to identify with us. I mean, how many of us have been in situations where we've tried to be compassionate to people? We've tried to identify with their pain. We, we, we come with comfort and consolation. But maybe someone turns to us and says, you know, you've never really been through what I've been through. You know, no, you've never been divorced. You've never lost a parent. You've never lost a child. You've never lost a leg. You've never lost a job. Whatever it is. And so ultimately, some people might feel that because of the fact that we have never been through what they've been through, that we really can't identify and we can't have compassion. And yet Jesus certainly does that in spades in terms of just his relationship with us and again what he accomplishes. Now the other good thing, or really two things that flow from, this, from these verses here, is that ultimately, because of the fact that Jesus identifies with his, our weaknesses, don't miss the fact that now, as we go before God, we can go before God with confidence. See, we can go before God knowing that He knows our frame, knowing the nature of sin, knowing the nature of deception, knowing the nature of temptation, in terms of all that we struggle with. And so basically, when we come before God, we come with the confidence knowing that He does identify with us, He does understand the struggle, 
And ultimately, we can go to Him for mercy and grace. See, we can't go, we don't need to go to Him based on what we're able to do. See, we don't go before God with strength. We don't go before God with, I mean, it's not wrong to do that, but we don't go in this context with righteousness. God, I'm coming to you because I've got everything figured out. God, I'm glad you're there with me because I'm really doing well in terms of this life. No, grace and mercy identifies the fact that I'm not doing it well. I know the struggle, God, and I'm glad that you do too. And so ultimately, one of the outpourings of this identification is confidence for us as we go before God. And again, part of the implications of Christmas, part of the implications of Jesus becoming flesh. But the other side of it, another implication that comes, is that because Jesus knew our frame, knew what we were dealing with, or knows what we do deal with, and was successful, was godly, was without sin... Now all of a sudden he becomes our example, doesn't he? Now he becomes the person we model our lives after in terms of what we, how we treat people and how we deal with each other. And so again, one of the primary implications, one of the things that only could be accomplished by virtue of God becoming a man is the fact that he would identify with man. The second thing, again, the second thing that could be accomplished only by vir virtue of Christmas, only by virtue of Jesus being born as a, as a human being, is in addition to identifying with man and putting on flesh, that gives Jesus the opportunity to reveal God to man. And so let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As we consider what these verses say about Jesus revealing, him, revealing God to man, that ultimately he would not be able to do that outside of being flesh. And so and hopefully you're just a few uh, books away to the left of the book of Hebrews. But Philippians chapter 2, verses, and I'll read through verse 11, but our focus will be Philippians 2, uh, 6 and 7. It says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, uh, in, in every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I mean, also, they don't miss this little phrase in verse 6, that he, that, that he didn't, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. That word grasped is, is actually a very interesting word. It's actually a violent word. It's actually a word that talks about robbing. It's about having power. And so ultimately what this is saying is that Jesus didn't think that people would understand the nature and character of God. That they would misunderstand God in terms of thinking that he's just authority and just righteousness. And I'm going to get you. And I'm after you. And I'm bigger than you so you better humble yourself. See, that's what Jesus would think would happen. But because he didn't want people to misunderstand that power, again, he didn't think that people would be able to grasp and understand that, that ultimately he came and made himself a servant. See, ultimately what Jesus needed to accomplish in terms of coming before man is he had to un help people understand the kind of God God is. That outside of Jesus, we may misunderstand we mis may misappropriate in terms of the kind of person God is. I mean, ultimately, what I think of in terms of the life of Jesus is I wonder what the most difficult thing for Jesus was. I mean, was it crucifixion? Was it the physical pain and suffering? Was it being separated from God in terms of those three hours on the cross where, again, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or is it this step right here? is the fact that the God of glory humbles himself and becomes flesh. You know, what, what, what gap exists between the divine and the finite? What exists in terms of eternity and, 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 and uh, infinity? What, what goes between eternal power and limited power? You, you know, we, we have to understand the, the struggle, the suffering, the humility that is part of that. 
I mean, to ultimately think something and then it happens, to speak a word and then it goes, and then being in a body of flesh? Again, maybe it's not fair to say that that's painful for Jesus, but is it difficult? Is it a struggle? Is it, is, is it, is it a humbling to him? And I think this is the picture that is described here. And we have to understand that what Jesus has sacrificed by virtue of just doing that, just living a human life. Again, we, we, we come to the earth, I was saying, someone would, I'm not sure where someone said this, um, but it, it, it was, you know, it was that Thursday Bible study, how it's strange for us, as far as human beings, is that we rejoice at someone's birth, and then we cry at someone's death, when it really should be opposite. That ultimately, when someone who is a believer dies, we should be rejoicing. You get to leave this earth and go to heaven, be in paradise, good for you. Oh my gosh, you came into this world? You, you, you have to go through suffering and pain and, and all the difficulties and trials of the earth? Oh, where we feel sorry for you, young boy or young girl. But, you know, and so, and so in many ways, that, that's the reality of Jesus becoming a human being. But understand what Paul is expressing here in Philippians, that he did that so we would understand what kind of God God is. That, that yes, he's a God of righteousness. Yes, he's a God of authority. Yes, he's a God of justice. Yes, he's a God of power. But he's also a God of mercy. He's also a God of humility. He's also a God of service. And so ultimately, in our understanding of God, we don't dismiss any aspect of what the Bible reveals about him. But in the balance of all that, we glean from that in terms of the kind of people we would desire to be. And ultimately, we understand that we receive from him. But ultimately, that's the purpose of Jesus doing that. I mean, ultimately, isn't that what John chapter 1 showed up, shows us? That the word, the verbal expression of God became flesh so God could be revealed more adequately. That ultimately, he could be Emmanuel. He could be God with us to get, increase our understanding of, of who God is. Again, when we want to know who God is, ultimately what we have to do is look at Jesus. Look at how he responds to sinners and people who think they're better than others. Look at the things that he cares about, the truth he teaches, the power he has. We recognize the, the hard things that Jesus says. You know, for those of us that would seek to cast Jesus, cast God in just this loving light, that this, again, puppy dogs and uh, fairy tales and unicorns in terms of all nicety. You know, you read some of the things that Jesus said, and it's clear he was not looking to win a popularity contest. That also he said what was necessary to say in terms of revealing God, revealing God's purpose, giving people the tools and the knowledge that they need in terms of understanding who God is, and behind everything, Behind everything that God did was an aspect of him manifesting God, making God evident and real to people. I mean, do you realize that Jesus becoming flesh actually reveals God's willingness to appeal to the empirical part of us? You know, for those of us who might want proof, well, go, you know, you know I, I believe what I see. Well, don't you understand by virtue of Jesus becoming a man, he's saying, yes, I understand that? I'm going to become a person. I'm not just going to say, hey, believe me as God, because I'm up in the heavens, and I created everything, and I'm just speaking down to you. No, I'm going to join you. I'm going to become a human being so that you can see, you can observe what kind of God I am. I will look at what Jesus does. Look at how he interacts with people. Look at what he teaches. And again, it's, it's empirical. It's something that we can see. And I think in some ways, some people might be thrown off, uh, by Jesus being born just once and not seeing him today. Like said, a lot of people would say, well, wait a minute, though. You're telling me that, okay, God is appealing to my empirical nature, and he sent Jesus to, to do that. Well, where is he right now? I can't see him right now. Well, you know something? It, it was contrary to God's purpose for Jesus to be born continually on this earth. That ultimately, because Jesus was born ultimately to die and ultimately pay the penalty for our sin, that that had to be within a lifetime. But when we think about history, when we think about the accuracy of what's communicated about Jesus, do you actually know that we have as much, if not more, historical evidence that Jesus existed and did what he did than we have that Julius Caesar existed and he did what he did? 
You know, in other words, you, you would say to anyone in terms of history and say, was Julius Caesar a real person? Yes, he was. Did he conquer and was he the, you know, became the first emperor of the Roman Empire? Did Brutus kill him on the Ides of March? All these things we would say, yeah, I know absolutely that, that uh, Julius Caesar did that. Well, like, like I said, we have more evidence that Jesus did what he did in terms of documented, actual uh, written form, in terms of what is communicated about him than anyone else in history. I mean, that, that speaks to his significance. That ultimately when, when people internalized Jesus and saw what he did and saw, saw what he came to accomplish, that ultimately they knew they wanted to write that down for posterity. And so that's the first thing in terms of not being thrown off by the idea that Jesus is not here now in person. But I think the second thing that we have to understand about Jesus' influence is that he, he, in some ways he's still revealed today in the effect that he has had in his nature and in his church. Do you know that in some ways the fact that 2,000 plus years after Jesus was born, that ultimately we're still following him, we're still gathering around to learn about him, we're seeking to know him better and, and to, to, to follow his example and model what he did. In many ways that's a testimony to who he is. I and mean, when you think about all the worldly dynamics, all the things that Jesus had going for him in terms of why people would follow him, in earthly terms, he, he had the least of those things. He was the least likely to, 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 to be remembered. That he was a peasant child in a backwards place in a defeated land in Palestine. There's absolutely no reason why Jesus should garner attention for the whole world. I mean, we can understand Caesar, you're the emperor of Rome, you're the controlling power, you're the one that gets the, your name in books and you're remembered in history and so on and so forth. I mean, just think about how many people were born at Jesus' time in the same context that no one ever remembers. That we didn't even know who they were. But what was unique about Jesus is because of who he is, what he did, what he revealed to that to that the, the people in that time in terms of something that went beyond human capacity, that went beyond human wisdom, that went beyond human power in terms of what he did. And so all the fact that we are following that, the fact that we continue in the message of Jesus is significant in terms of just God appealing to that empirical nature. I mean, next week as we go back to our study in the book of Rome, uh, Romans rather, um, you know, I thought for the sake of Christmas, uh, we probably didn't want to start with Romans 119, where it talks about the wrath of God being revealed to all mankind. Not, not quite a quick Christmas message, uh, but we will be returning to that. And ultimately part of that passage is how God's eternal nature and power is so evident to man that ultimately man is without excuse. And so something we'll look at is all those reasons why from the whole expression of creation, that is also an appeal to our empirical nature. That ultimately God does come to us and says, yes, I know you want things to be reasonable. You want things to be known. I know you're people that see and touch and feel. And there's a part of you that wants that empirical data to rely on. And ultimately, faith is not inconsistent with those things. God is not inconsistent with those things. And the fact that Jesus ultimately became a man shows God's willingness to ultimately identify with that aspect of ourselves in terms of him revealing himself to us. And what a powerful expression in terms of this passage here, in terms of just all that Jesus accomplished. See, it, it's not only, though, that Jesus was humble enough to become a human being. Take, take that step from the divine to the human, but then beyond that, he took on, a, on the whole perspective of a servant. He actually humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. I mean, basically, we know the musical term crescendo, and ultimately that crescendo is supposed to be building up, building up to a bigger moment. Well, guess what? That's what Paul does. Paul, in some ways, is writing a musical piece here in terms of what he's communicating about Jesus. Yes, he didn't think that eternity, equality with God could be grasped. We, they misunderstand who he is. So he humbled himself, become a man. But not only become a man, he became a servant. Not only become a servant, but he came a servant to death. Even that on the dead, on the cross. And now because of that, what does God do? He raises him up to power. 
that ultimately now Jesus is the highest and has the exalted place. Why? Because he became a man. That ultimately outside Jesus becoming human, taking on flesh, being a servant in this way, he would not even have his place in God's economy outside of doing that. And so that's another thing that, again, Jesus accomplished by virtue of becoming flesh, but again, all an aspect of God revealing himself to man. And so, that, so, so therefore, when we think about what God could only accomplish by virtue of being flesh, he was able to identify with us, he would be able to reveal God to man, and then thirdly, he would be able to die for man. I mean, that's only one thing to consider is that you can't nail God to a cross. And so part of the reason why Jesus had to have flesh was to accomplish the work of salvation that was accomplished only through his death on the cross. But for that, let's turn back to the book of Hebrews in, the verse, in, in, in chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. As we look at this whole idea of what, it, what is a reason, one of, one, of, one of the benefits that come to God, that come to us by virtue of Jesus becoming flesh, that he actually dies for us. And so look at verses, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy, destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order to be, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. And hopefully you see in all the passages that we've turned to, and the reason why we've turned there, all the things that reference in terms of why he became flesh. These are the things that happened because he became flesh, he became a man. And so also when we think of what, what Hebrews 2, uh, 14 through 18 says here, and ultimately us being enslaved to our fear of death, when we think about the hold that Satan has on us when it comes to that fear. See, I think when it comes to us as human beings, we ultimately love to control things. We, need to, we like to be on top of things. We like to understand things. We want clarity. We, we, been, we, we um, want, want to be able to manage our circumstances, manage relationship, have all our ducks in order. And also when that happens, that's the way we alleviate fear. See, the minute we face something that's overwhelming to us, what we can't control, what we can't manage, that's when we start becoming afraid, right? All of a sudden, a hurricane comes around. I can't manage that. A flood comes. I can't stop the water. Death comes. I can't stop that. Well, ultimately, that, that's where the fear of death comes. Death is, again, the unconquerable conqueror. That, that when it comes to our capacity... I mean, something that I do seek to communicate whenever I'm doing funerals is that trying to bring, to, trying to bring people to the reality of their finiteness. That just in case people don't understand the fear of death, they should have. I mean, when we start, once we start getting 50, once, start, once we start getting 60, 70, all of a sudden the reality of death the fact that we're not going to be here forever starts coming to the fore as we read the obituaries. Oh boy, that friend died. Oh, that friend died. And all of a sudden, we, again, outside of Christ, we start thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen when I die? Where am I going to go when I die? What are people going to say about me when I... Okay, maybe not. Um, yeah, we are, maybe. But anyways, um, but so we have to understand what... James is talking about, I'm sorry, what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here in terms of Jesus freeing us from that fear. See, because again, we can't conquer death. We can't control death. We don't even know when it's going to happen. We could live another 20 years or we could die tomorrow. 
And so that, that, if you can't manage that, if you can't control that, young people die, old people die, die, middle-aged people die, everyone, they, they, you can never be in a situation where you know, I can say with complete confidence that I'm going to live another 20 years. You can't say that. Because you just, and even, isn't it true in our world today that with all the craziness and violence that happens, that it seems like every day you read the paper that someone's <laughs> killing someone out of the blue, just saw something, just, just what, what happened yesterday, some neo-Nazi um, who's dating this girl and his parents don't want her to date him and he comes and shoots him. You know, that, that's just, an, I mean, once you have a culture of violence, a culture where that's promoted and, and recognized and, and all these things in terms of what, what, what crazy people do in terms of those things, but all of that, again, is reflective of something we can't control and how death can come at any time. But see, Jesus came to resolve that. Amen. See, but outside of him identifying without, with us, outside of him taking on flesh, he couldn't be an adequate sacrifice. He couldn't accomplish what we needed him to accomplish. I mean, ultimately, when you think about it, that being man made Jesus an appropriate sacrifice for sin, being God made Jesus an adequate, adequate sacrifice for sin. That when we think about how much sense does it make that God would die for man? How much does it sense, make, make sense that this is the way God would accomplish it? That this would be the path of salvation. This would be the resolution in terms of resolving our fear of death and making a provision for it. That God would die? That Jesus would be sacrificed? See, it just doesn't make rational sense to us. Because again, it, it doesn't make sense. Now, all of a sudden, a man dies for a man? That makes more sense, right? And so that's why God had to become flesh. He had to identify with us. He had to be the same in essence in order to provide salvation for us. And even though it doesn't make sense in terms of uh, worth and value, like, like I'm not worth that, but God decided I was worth that. That, that again, I can't, I can't go to God and say, hey God, you better die for me. Because <laughs> again, I have no standing to do that. But once God does that, God reveals his character. And again, reveals his identification with us in resolving a problem we couldn't resolve on our own. But again, that is part of the value that comes to us from God by virtue of Jesus becoming flesh. See, outside of Christmas... Outside of Bethlehem, outside of whenever that conversation happened in eternity past, where, where God said, hey, this is what's going to happen. Or Jesus volunteered and said, hey, I have an idea. I'm willing to do that. Because you know how the Godhead, if you ever want to think about how the Trinity works together, that also means the picture the Bible gives us is that God plans the plan. The Son, the second person of the Trinity, carries out the plan and the Holy Spirit, the third member, applies that plan, or applies that work to, to, this, to a situation in terms of our hearts and our lives, in terms of our salvation. But again, however that worked out, we know the reality of what happened. And again, the things that could only happen by, by virtue of us, uh, about, uh, by virtue of Jesus being flesh, becoming a man, only because of Bethlehem, only because of the decision made in eternity past. And again, this salvation... This freedom from the fear of death is really at the core of what Jesus accomplished. You know, all those other things are vitally important. When you think about God's ability and willingness to identify with man, and therefore Jesus, you've got to become flesh. The fact that God wanted to reveal himself, he wanted to be known, he wanted us to understand the kind of God he was. Okay, Jesus, you've got to, got to, got to, you've got to become a man. And you know something, Jesus... They need salvation. They need sin forgiven. You've got to die. You've got to free them from this fear of death. You've got to make what's on the other side known rather than unknown. Okay, you have to become flesh. All those things require him to be, become flesh. And even though those first two are pretty important, this last one I think is the ultimate in terms of what Jesus would seek to accomplish. And I think it's important for us to get the main me message in terms of why we celebrate Christmas what it's all about. And let us read this story, and hopefully you get the point from it. It says here, it was December of 1903, that after many attempts, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground and into the air at Kitty Hawk. Thrilled over the accomplishment, they telegraphed this message to their sister Catherine, 
We have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message. He glanced at it and said, how nice, the boys will be home for Christmas. That's what you got out of that? In other words, the first people, the people that got a, a machine a plane off the ground, that, again, we, we, we look at that in memorial, right? All those aviators and flying enthusiasts, that's where it began, right? The seeds of flying at Kitty Hawk. And they're going to be home for Christmas? See, see, oftentimes we receive the message of Christmas in that way. Oh, isn't it nice? Born in a manger. What a nice silent night. Oh, isn't it nice? The shepherds and Mary and Joseph. And oh, Christmas is so... Don't you get the main message? He's here to free you from your, from your fear of death. That ultimately he had to become flesh, born in whatever way God chose, so again, he could have our flesh, our bodies, so when he died, it could apply to you. And see, if you miss that message, you miss the primary message of Christmas. I would even be so bold to say, is don't even celebrate it. If you don't get that, what's the use in making up Santa Claus, or having a family dinner, or giving gifts because of what? Like, if you don't get the main message of what Jesus came to accomplish, then you really, you're, you're, almost, you're almost shaming it. You're almost, you're certainly discrediting it in terms of not getting the point. And so again, for those of us who do, that is the message we bring. That ultimately we are messengers of reconciliation. We're messengers of Jesus making all humankind right with God for those who believe on him. And we're also messengers of freeing people from their fear of death. Again, that great unknown, the thing we can't control outside of the power of Jesus. And again, Jesus became flesh to resolve these issues, to identify with us, to reveal God to man, and able to be able to provide salvation to us. But you know, Jesus did that work, and just the last thing that I need to mention is that for those of you who have never believed, that ultimately that's the linchpin. That God has done this miraculous and powerful work in terms of God becoming a human being, living his life here, revealing God, and then dying on a cross. But if you don't believe, if you don't accept, if again, you don't take your free will and say, yes, I want and need that, yes, I believe that that's true, all those things are part of that dynamic of what we bring to the table. And see, it's the only thing we can bring to the table that also when we understand what God requires for righteousness, for us being made right with Him, He's got to do all that work and just say, hey, do you believe? Do you accept? Do you need? Do you validate? Do you see that it's true? And all those things are part of that faith of salvation. And so let's just bow our heads and pray and just go before God. Father, I do pray for anyone here that, that has not taken that step of faith, that today could be their day of salvation. That any moment in time is a time that we can reach out to you in terms of just recognizing our need, recognizing the truth of Jesus, recognizing the requirement that your righteousness had that we would be made right with God only by Jesus Christ. That is the essence of why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because he's the only one that took on flesh. He was only, only the only one divine to be God and be an adequate sacrifice for us. And so for anyone here that hasn't clung to faith in Jesus, believed in him, I pray that they would. And just come before him. And, and, and if, if, again, it's the faith that matters, not the words, but to, to, to pray to God, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I, I know that my independence keeps me from you, but I recognize that Jesus died for me. And I claim his death as the payment for my sin. I believe that he died for me. And I'm grateful for the salvation you bring. And I think the only thing I would add in terms of just recognizing what that salvation means is that it's not an end but a beginning. That ultimately it's welcoming you into the family of God, relationship with God, where God would now seek to empower you and infuse you with all the dynamics of what he brings in terms of his person and his will to make you the kind of person he created you to be in the first place. And so this salvation is a first step in terms of just you being made right with him.
to ultimately join him in his kingdom. And so, Father, we lift these things before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.